So then our strain tensor can be written like this. I don't know why the fractions don't show up, but we can we can write our strain tensor, which has nine components or six unique ones, as something more compact. And you know, here I'm using the the sort of shorthand notation that x uh, that takes on the component one, y takes on component two. And you know now we're including the third dimension, which isn't in our 2D picture, but uh, then z would be component three. And so this is actually why th that we like the, the, the we use the two because then we can write this thing so compactly, right? Without the two there, we we couldn't write it so compactly. Because so now if you just if you want say epsilon x x which is also epsilon one one, then we just choose, right, so in this equation, i goes from one to three and j goes from one to three. So we just choose i and j equal to one and one, right? And so then if I just choose i and j equal to one one, because that's the component I'm interested in, and plug it into this equation, then I get one half partial u one partial x plus Partial u1, nah, partial x1, 1, right? Uh, and of course, that's equal to 1 half times 2, partial u1, partial x1, uh, which is equal to partial u1, partial x1, which then going back to the, you know, that that's equivalent to partial ux, partial x. Right? That's what we had before. Likewise, if we want partial, I mean, if we want epsilon xy, then we have, that's epsilon 1, 2 using this notation. So we have 1, uh, u1 partial x2 plus u2 partial x1, which is just equal to, going back to the old notation, So everybody see how that works? So that's why we needed to, to define the shear strain as two, uh, so that this would work. No, uh, no, what you don't see is, uh, if we don't make that assumption, what we end up with is a definition of strain that looks like this. Uh, so what you don't see is, you know, that, that assumption of smallness gets rid of these terms. So if you ever take a graduate course in continuum mechanics, you define strain more rigorously and these terms li live on, right? And this is a, it's because, uh, it's because this, this strain here is only valid under, well, small strains and no rotation. Uh, the, the curious thing about this, this, these, these higher order terms actually cancel out any rotation, right? So if I, you know, if, if I take something and I stretch it, right? So I take my pen and I stretch it, and then I were to rotate it, right? The strain shouldn't change, right? So once I, say I, I, I sort of do two motions, right? I stretch it and I compute the strain. Then I rotate it, I should still have the same strain. Right. So I haven't stretched it anymore. Well, it turns out, without these higher order terms, as you rotate, right, because you're, as you rotate, you're changing these guys, right, U, the U's, right, rigid body rotation. 
you'd actually get a strain that, that changes value as you go. Uh, let me see. I don't really... Uh, Sorry, I'm looking for a, looking for a, something I I have that illustrates this, but uh, Okay, so, so here's our little unit cube, right? And up there I have little slider bars that represent the strain in the XX, YY, and, and the shear strain. So if I change it, uh, if I change it, I don't know, maybe it will blow it up a little bit. So right, so clearly I'm straining the thing, right? And you see the strain values are changing. And I have two things here. I have the linear strain. That's the one we, we just derived, OK? And then I have something called the green strain. Well, that's that nonlinear strain. That has those extra terms in it, OK? And you see they're very close to one another if all I'm doing is stretching. Same thing if I, if I stretch it in the y direction. Right? The, the terms are they're fairly close to one another. But now watch what happens if I rotate it. Now, look, again, I, at this point, I'm just doing a pure rotation. I'm not stretching. Right? So the strain is a measure of stretch. Right? It shouldn't change under a deformation, a rotation. Look what happens. So all I'm doing is doing a rigid body rotation after I've stretched it. And the linear strain, the one we computed, is changing values. And the green strain is not. So uh, you know, I wasn't planning on going into this, but you asked the question. And uh, it just goes to show you that a lot of things we do in engineering are approximations. And it's important to know under what approximations they're, they're valid. right? So this small strain is only un valid under small gradients in U and zero rotation. Right? The good thing about the Earth is that you know we, it doesn't rotate a lot, right? It's not a, you know the, a rock 10,000 feet in the ground is not going under undergoing massive rotations, right? especially at the scale of what we call a, a continuum element, right? which might be the size of this room. Right? There's not there's not going massive rotations. Right? You know, so, but if you're working on um, something like a, you know, a, 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 you know, if you're working on like an aircraft wing, right, an aircraft wing can actually have quite, can have actually have quite small strains, but very, very large rotations as it sort of deflects, you know, under the, under the loads of flight. So the strains are very quite small. Uh, which is why the airplane doesn't fall off, right? I mean, because you know, it doesn't break in two. Because the strains are small. When you take something very long and you just move it a little bit, you, you don't have a lot of strain, but you can have a lot of deflection or rotation uh, over a very long distance. 
and and so in that in that scenario, you'd want to use some kind of nonlinear strain measure, or you get the wrong answer, and then your aircraft wing might fall off, which wouldn't be good. Okay, so everybody understands sort of how the this compact tensor notation works. But if I just choose an i and a j, uh, and you know, again, you can think of one as x, two as y, three as z, and you just plug them in and work work it out, and then you can get any component of the strain in terms of displacement. Okay. So there's also something that we'll define as the volumetric strain. So the volumetric strain, remember we can think of the strain tensor as sort of a matrix. Does anybody know what the trace of a matrix is? Ever heard that terminology? Did we talk about it? trace of a matrix? So the trace of a matrix is just the sum of the diagonal entries. Okay. So the trace of the strain tensor is the sum of the diagonal entries. and uh, it's, it's that. So this represents, uh, sometimes you'll hear this called uh, the dilatation. Right. So this is a measure of the, the sort of volumetric change, right? So if I have my little cube and I apply some external loads to it, and the cube deforms into a smaller cube. Then the dilatation is the, which is the volumetric strain, right, is, is the ratio of the volume of the black cube to the red one. Again, under the assumption of small strains. 